Imagine clocking out on Thursday, knowing you've got a three-day weekend ahead, every single week. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, buckle up, brainiacs, because science is making this dream a reality. And trust me, that's just the tip of the iceberg in our workplace revolution. Hey there, you brilliant Bunsen burners. Theodore here, ready to ignite your synapses with another mind-bending episode of our Future of Work series. Today, we're diving into a world where weekends are longer, AI is your coworker, and your office might just be a figment of the metaverse. Our tech-savvy experts are here to guide us through this brave new work world. So grab your virtual reality headsets, because the future of work is weirder and possibly more wonderful than we ever imagined. Hey everyone, so are you ready to say goodbye to that old nine to five grind? We're gonna explore the future of work today. Let's do it. Okay, so we're diving into a ton of articles. Yeah. All about the future of work. It's like the biggest workplace revolution since, well, ever. And we're calling this decentralization. It's a world where work is way more flexible, remote opportunities are everywhere, mm -hmm. and even that traditional company structure, you know, the one we're all used to, it's getting flipped on its head. Yeah, it's pretty wild the stuff we're seeing in these articles. It's like a completely different world of work out there compared to just a few years ago. Right. Like, remember when working from home was like this super rare perk that only a few people got? Totally. Now, 87%, a whopping 87% of people expect more hybrid work models. Wow. So that begs the question, how do you prepare for this hybrid future? Yeah. Right? Got to be well, I think we have to start with some of the basics. Like, how do you master remote communication? Right. How do we set boundaries between our work life and our home life? Mm -hmm. And maybe, just maybe, how do we design a home office that would make even the most hardcore cubicle dweller jealous? That's a good goal. Right. But it's not even just about where we work. It's about how we work. 100%. This isn't just about ditching the commute. Although, let's be honest, that is a big perk. But it really is about a much deeper shift in how we view that work-life balance, employee mm. well-being, yes, and even the very structure of these organizations. It's like this whole hustle culture thing, you know? Yeah. It seems like it's finally starting to fade away. I hope so. And I think people are ready for something that's more balanced. I mean, who can blame them? Our sources show that 62% of workers are feeling the pressure these days. Oh, yeah. And it's no surprise. That traditional work model, you know, the one we're talking about moving away from, that thing was practically designed to burn people out. Yeah, it's a recipe for disaster. So what's the antidote? Well, it seems like companies are finally starting to get it, at least a little bit. Flexible schedules are becoming more common. It's about time. Comprehensive wellness programs. Yeah. And better mental health resources. We're seeing it more and more. Finally, a happy and healthy employee is a productive employee. Breach. And speaking of productivity, let's talk about this whole four-day work week movement. Okay. Is that just a pipe dream or is that something that people could strive for? I think it's definitely gaining some momentum. Companies are starting to realize that cramming five days of work into four days, that's not the answer. Totally. It's about working smarter, not harder. Right. Like maybe it's time to get rid of those pointless meetings, you know. Please. And just focus on the stuff that actually moves the needle, what's actually important, yeah. you know? Yes. Focus on the things that matter. And we're seeing companies experiment with a lot of different models. Some are doing the four-day work week. The whole thing. Yeah. While others are trying, like, compressed schedules. Okay. Or rotating days off. Gotcha. It's about finding what works, not just for the organization, but for the employees, too. For sure. Ultimately, it's about shifting from that culture of, like, presenteeism. Mm -hmm. You know, where you just have to be present right. to one that really values results. What are you actually doing with your time? Which isn't that what we all want? To be judged on the things that we're producing. Absolutely. And not just the hours that we're logging, whether we're at the office or at our home office or wherever. Right. You're measured by your output. Exactly. But that does bring us to kind of an interesting question. If everyone's working remotely or at least on these flexible schedules, how do companies even maintain a strong company culture? How do they do that? 
That is a huge question. Yeah. And it's going to be one of the biggest challenges in this decentralized future. I think companies are going to have to be really, really deliberate about this. Totally. Because it's not enough to just have the right communication tools, like having Slack, having Zoom, that kind of thing. Yeah. Companies need to find these creative ways to build camaraderie, make people feel like they're part of a team, mm -hmm. you know? And then there's the challenge of fostering that sense of belonging. Yeah. And making sure that people can communicate across time zones and across cultures. It's a lot. Yeah, it is. But I do love the idea of getting creative with it. Like maybe companies can have virtual team building activities or mm. or online social events. Yeah. Or even those strategically planned in-person retreats. Yeah. For the people who can make it, of course. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Even small things, you know, can make a really big difference in making employees feel connected. For sure. Speaking of connection, let's talk about another trend that's shaking things up in the workplace. Mm -hmm. The rise of the gig economy, but inside corporations. Yeah. So this is where traditional companies, they're embracing the flexibility. Totally. And all the specialized skills that gig workers bring to the table. Absolutely. So imagine this. You're a company. You need someone who has a very specific skill set. Mm -hmm. but you only need it for maybe a short-term project. So instead of going through the whole process of hiring someone full-time, you bring in a freelancer or a contractor. Makes sense. Right. It's kind of a win-win, isn't it? It is. I was just thinking that. The company gets access to a much wider pool of talent. Right. And then these gig workers, they get to choose projects that they're actually excited about. Totally. They can set their own hours. Oh. And potentially work from anywhere. Sounds pretty good to me. But how do we make sure that those gig workers still feel valued? That's a good question. And like integrated into the team, even though they're juggling all these other projects. Yeah, because essentially, even if it's short term, they are a part of the team. Right. And so I think it's about things like, you know, really clear communication about everything. Yes, communication is key. And well-defined expectations, of course. Yes. And this should go without saying, but prompt payment. For sure. But even small gestures, like inviting them to those virtual team meetings, right? Yes. Recognizing their contributions publicly. Yeah. Those little things can make a difference. It's about creating that sense of community, even if it's just in the virtual space. Totally. And let's not forget about the need to constantly be learning new things in this really fast-paced, constantly changing job market. Oh, for sure. You always have to be learning. What are your thoughts on this whole micro-credential movement that we keep hearing about? Okay, so micro-credentials, I think they're a game changer. Think of them like these mini certifications. Mm. So you can learn a specific skill quickly without having to commit to like a full-blown degree program. It's like upskilling but on demand. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. You need to brush up your data analysis skills because you have a new project. Boom. Micro-credential. You need to become a project management guru. Another micro-credential. Exactly. It's how people can stay ahead of the curve and yeah. get those really in-demand skills that employers want. Which kind of brings us to maybe the elephant in the room, or maybe we should call it the algorithm in the room. Oh, okay. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Because artificial intelligence is everywhere these days. It is. And it's causing a lot of anxiety for people. Understandably. This is people's livelihoods. Exactly. The advancements in AI are happening so fast. Too fast. And people are left wondering if a robot's going to take their job. And honestly, the statistics aren't exactly reassuring. A whopping 78% of people are concerned about AI and how it's going to affect their jobs. So what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, it's completely valid that people are worried. Like we said, this is how people make a living. But also, it's not even just about job security. It's not. It's also about the ethics of using AI in the workplace. Mm. Like, we have to make sure that it's used responsibly, okay. fairly, and transparently. Right. I can't just throw it around and hope for the best. So how do we do that? What does that look like? Like, how do you implement AI ethically? I think a good place to start is acknowledging that AI isn't neutral. Okay. It learns from the data that we feed it. And the people who design the AI, well, they have biases too, you know. Right. So we have to be very intentional. We have to eliminate the bias in the algorithms mm. and make sure that AI is enhancing human capabilities. Instead of replacing them. That's exactly. So maybe instead of being afraid of AI, we can figure out how to work with it. Exactly. Use it to automate those tedious tasks yes, that nobody right. wants to do anyway. Threes. And then we free up our time so we can do more of the creative and strategic work. Exactly. It's like AI is a tool, right? <laughs> Not something that's going to come take your job. Right. It's a way to augment the abilities that we already have mm -hmm. 
to make work more equitable and hopefully a lot more fulfilling for everyone. Okay. That's a future that I can get behind. But with all these changes in how we work, it makes you wonder about the traditional company structure, right? Mm. I mean, is it going to become totally outdated? Yeah, like a fax machine or a phone booth. Like, will we see it in a museum one day? Maybe. That's yeah. a great question. Because these articles suggest that there's this new model okay. where hierarchies are much flatter. Decision-making is more distributed. Gotcha. And employee economy is how everything works. So basically what we're talking about are those DAOs, those decentralized autonomous organizations that we keep hearing about. Yes, exactly. Sound like something straight out of a science fiction novel. They really do, right. Uh. But they're not science fiction. DAOs are very real. Wow. And they have the potential to completely change how we think about companies. Yeah. And work. Like, they could change everything about how we work. Okay, so we've established that DAOs sound pretty radical, but I think I need a little refresher. What exactly are they? So, imagine a company. Right. But there's no CEO. Okay. There's no rigid hierarchy. It's just a collective of people working towards a common goal. So it's like a company run by, like, a hive mind. Yeah, kind of. It's really interesting how it works. So, in a DAO, every member, at least in some structures has a say in how the organization is run. Okay, so how do they make those decisions? By voting. And the votes are all recorded and verified on a blockchain. So it's like this secure, transparent digital ledger. Hold on. Blockchain? We're talking about the same technology that's behind cryptocurrencies. Yep, the exact same. Blockchain is what makes DAOs possible. It brings transparency, security, and and make sure that those decisions can't be tampered with. So instead of boardroom battles and office politics, we've got these transparent voting records that anyone can see. Exactly. I'm starting to get it. But how do you make sure that everyone's voice is actually heard? Let's break this down. When we talk about AI creating more jobs, we're not just replacing old jobs with robot versions. It's more like AI is creating entirely new industries. Think about it like this. When cars were invented, we didn't just replace horse-drawn carriage drivers with car drivers. We ended up with mechanics, traffic engineers, car designers, and even drive through restaurant workers. AI is doing the same thing, but on a much bigger scale. So while some jobs might disappear, a whole bunch of new ones we haven't even thought of yet are popping up. When you have a structure that's so decentralized. That's where those governance tokens that we were talking about come in. Okay. So it's kind of like voting shares, but with a technological twist. Members can use these tokens to propose ideas or vote on proposals. And often, the more tokens that you hold, the more weight your vote carries. So it's like a democracy, but your voting power depends on your investment in the DAO. Yeah, it's a way to balance the power. You want the people who are the most invested in the success of the DAO to have a say in its direction. Now, with that being said, some DAOs are designed so everyone has an equal vote, regardless of how many tokens they hold. Oh, interesting. So it's not like a one-size-fits-all situation. Not at all. There's a lot of room for experimentation with DAOs. But I have to ask, how do you keep things from becoming totally chaotic? I mean, does everything get put up for a vote? Does anything get done? That's a fair question. It's true that not every decision needs to be put to a vote. A lot of DAOs, they have automated processes and delegated authority for the day-to-day -day stuff. So it's a hybrid approach. Some things are decentralized and some things are more traditional. Exactly. And it's worth pointing out that the entire DAO landscape is always evolving. There are constantly new models and governance structures emerging. So we're all figuring it out as we go. Pretty much. All right, let's simplify this DAO concept. A decentralized autonomous organization is like Wikipedia for company decision-making. In a traditional company, decisions come from the top down, like a dictionary written by a few experts. But in a DAO, it's more like Wikipedia, where everyone can contribute and vote on changes. Every member gets a say in how things are run, using special digital tokens to vote. It's democracy meets blockchain technology. This could revolutionize how companies operate making them more transparent and giving employees a real voice in company decisions. It's turning the idea of corporate hierarchy on its head. Which is kind of exciting. It is. But you mentioned earlier that DAOs sound like something out of a science fiction novel, right? Right. Can you give me an example of one, a real one? Sure. Have you heard of Vita Dio? Vita Dio. It sounds familiar. So Vita Dao is a community-governed organization, structured as a DAO, of course. Okay. 
and they're focused on longevity research. Longevity research, what's that? Essentially, they want to make breakthroughs that help people live longer and healthier lives. Wow, okay. But instead of relying on traditional methods of funding, they're using their DAO structure to crowdsource funding for their research. So they're using decentralization to accelerate scientific discoveries. Exactly. And because it's a DAO, everyone has a voice in the research, which means a greater diversity of perspectives. And that often leads to more innovative solutions. It's like they're democratizing innovation, bringing the best minds together from all over the world to tackle these huge challenges. That's a great way to put it. And it's not just science either. We're seeing DAOs pop up in finance, tech, art, music, you name it. Wow. Okay, so I get it. I'm officially fascinated. But can we s switch gears for a minute? Talk about something else that decentralization is impacting recruitment. Okay. I mean, everyone knows that the, the traditional hiring process can be the worst, right? The worst. Yeah. For everyone involved. It's like you're navigating this minefield of resumes and cover letters, and then you have the interviews, which are always so awkward. The worst. So with this big push towards decentralization, are we saying goodbye to the HR department completely? I think the role of HR is being completely reimagined. Yeah. So instead of that centralized department that makes all the hiring decisions, we're seeing a more distributed approach. So instead of this one-size-fits-all approach, we give individual teams more power to decide who they hire. You got it. Teams are able to define their own criteria, reach out to candidates directly and make decisions based on a deeper understanding of what they're looking for. Okay, I can see the logic in that. Yeah. It seems like it would make the hiring process a lot more efficient and effective. But it what about <laughs> bias? Let's unpack this idea of micro-credentials and personalized learning. Think of traditional degrees as a set menu at a restaurant. You get what they offer, whether you want all of it or not. Micro-credentials are more like a buffet. You pick exactly what you need. Need to learn about AI ethics? There's a micro-credential for that. Want to understand blockchain? Grab that micro-credential. It's all about learning specific skills quickly, without the filler. And personalized learning? That's like having a personal chef who knows exactly what nutrients you need and how you like your food prepared. It's education tailored just for you, adapting as you learn. This approach could make staying relevant in a fast-changing job market much easier and more efficient. That's the million dollar question, right? Right. How do we make sure that these decentralized hiring practices are fair and inclusive? It's definitely something that we need to be really careful about. But one of the promising solutions is the rise of these skills-based platforms like LinkedIn. Okay. And even some of these Web3 platforms like Bondex are doing some really interesting things. Hold on, Web3 platforms? We're going even further into the future now. I know, right? So these platforms, they connect companies and potential candidates. Mm. But it's based on verified skills and endorsements instead of relying on resumes or academic credentials. So it's like, instead of caring about that fancy degree, they care about what you can actually do. Exactly. It's about what you can do. It levels the playing field. Everyone has a fair shot, you know, and it helps reduce bias too. Okay. I like it. It's not about your background or your connections. It's about you can actually bring to the table. So it's like this meritocracy, but for talent. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And a lot of these platforms, they use endorsements and peer reviews, too. So it's not just one person's opinion of your work. It's like a whole community vouching for you. OK, where do I sign up? <laughs> but before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's go back to something we were talking about earlier. With all of these changes to how we work, all these new ways, what happens to the traditional office building? That is the question, isn't it? Some people think the office is over, like it's done. It'll be a relic of the past like phone booths. Or fax machines. Exactly. But other people, they think the office will transform. It won't be a place where everyone has to be five days a week. It'll be more of a hub for collaborating, okay. for innovating, mm. and for those important face-to-face -face connections that we're not always great at doing virtually, you know? I like that. So instead of being chained to our desks, we'd use offices for brainstorming? or team building exercises. Exactly. Or just catching up with our coworkers every once in a while. Right, and offices would be designed differently too. They'd be these creative spaces hmm. made for interaction and inspiration, not just rows and rows of cubicles. Maybe we can donate all the cubicles to a museum somewhere. Maybe, hmm. but really the future of work, it's still being written. These articles, they show us what's possible, what might happen, Right. but it's up to us to decide what we want that future to look like. I love that. 
we're not just along for the ride. We actually get a say in how this whole thing plays out. We can build a world where technology helps us. Yes. Where our work is flexible, but it's still fulfilling. Yes. And everyone has a chance to succeed. I love it. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, there you have it, everyone. That's our deep dive into the future of work. It's going to be a wild ride, that's for sure. But it's also a future full of possibilities. But here's the thing. It's not just about companies adapting, right? It's about us adapting, too. So what role do you want to play in shaping this flexible future of work? That's something to think about as you go on your own career journey. Until next time, happy working, however and wherever you work best. There you have it, you magnificent molecules. We've peeked into the crystal ball of career futures, and it's looking both thrilling and terrifying. Will we all be working four-day weeks in our AI-optimized home offices? Or will we be duking it out with robots for the last remaining human jobs? Only time will tell. But one thing's for sure, the future of work is anything but boring. So keep questioning, keep adapting, and who knows, you might just end up with that coveted chief meme officer position. Until next time, stay curious, stay brilliant, and maybe start befriending your AI assistants, just in case. Yeah.